It's time now for perspective. Ahead of upcoming European Parliament elections, should the bloc be preparing for a sharp turn to the right? And if so, what does that mean for European policy and, by extension, European unity? We can cross now to Florence, Italy, to speak with Simon Hicks, a professor of European and Comparative Politics at the London School of Economics. Thank you so much, Simon, for being with us on France 24 this morning. Uh, now, one recent poll predicts that the nationalist right and the far right could jointly pick up nearly a quarter of all seats available in the European Parliament in June. What do you think that would mean for the Parliament? Well, firstly, it's going to change significantly the way coalition politics works in the parliament. So currently, right now, in the current parliament, the centre group, the Liberal group in the middle of the parliament, um, are pivotal in deciding whether coalitions form to the left or to the right in the parliament. In the new parliament, the EPP on the centre right are going to be the middle group, and there's going to be a big block to their right. And so if the EPP decide to vote with the right, they could form majorities on, on issues like environment policy. And we know from voting in the current parliament that the, the centre-left majority has tended to win on those sorts of issues. But in the new parliament, we're going to see a sort of populist right majority, particularly on environment questions. And so, for example, on issues like agriculture and regulation of agriculture, where we've seen you know, tractors on the streets in cities all across Europe, we could see a more climate sceptic majority in the European Parliament voting against the ambitious climate change agenda that the European Parliament has been pushing for the last five years. Now, you've predicted that the uh, far-right identity and democracy grouping in the European Parliament, currently the sixth largest of seven, is going to gain 40 seats in June or thereabouts, making it the third largest grouping. Now, that's a spot, as you mentioned, currently occupied by the Liberals. Who is in this grouping and what do they stand for? Well, so this is uh, members like uh, Gerd Wilders in the Netherlands or Le Pen in, in France, um, AFD in Germany. I mean, we're going to see all across Europe in about nine member states, we think, um, radical right parties are going to become the largest uh, party from those countries. And in about nine other member states, they're going to be the second or the third largest. So we're going to see a wave of support for populist right parties, either in the ID group or in the ECR group. So together, these two groups to the right of the EVP, as you said, could get a, a quarter of those seats and they stand for they used to be very anti-european they're still quite euro skeptic but they're they're now no longer in favor of of withdrawing from the eu perhaps after the brexit brexit experience but what they're in favor of is a different sort of europe they argue for a sort of fortress europe a europe that's that's more uh, opposed to immigration a europe that sort of stands up for european interests in the world a sort of anti-china policy potentially an anti-american policy protecting european business um, so these are the sort of policies Policies that these parties are in favour of. They're very divided on, on attitudes towards Putin and Russia, with some of the members of this group more sympathetic to Putin, like Orban, and some of the members of, of, of these parties on the radical right being much more critical of Russia, particularly the parties from Central and Eastern Europe, like in Poland. So although they're united on environment questions, on migration questions, they're deeply divided on some European foreign policy issues. And you mentioned Ukraine just there, and you mentioned as well uh, Hungary's Viktor Orban, uh, who has historically been rather pally at various points with Putin. Um, what is this uh, predicted resurgence of the far right likely to mean for European policy in Ukraine, do you think? I think it's, it's not clear what it means for Ukraine. So far, this, as I mentioned, the, these groups are divided on, on Ukraine. Um, like Orban there, he's very much in favour. He's more sympathetic towards Putin, more critical of Europe and, and NATO's uh, strategy towards Ukraine. Um, that's very different, for example, than, than the Polish party, the Law and Justice Party in Poland. But we're hearing recently that Law and Justice in Poland and Orban seem to have buried the hatchet and they're even discussing becoming members of the same group in the European Parliament. I think this is largely to do with they realise if they can come together, they're going to be more powerful. And, and the, the carrot of having more power in the parliament is, is very powerful for sort of bringing these groups together and, and reconciling their differences. So you say it's a powerful, tasty carrot. How likely is it, though, do you think that these uh, right wing and far right groups are likely to bury various hatchets and, and join forces in Brussels? I think we probably end up with two groups in the parliament to the right of the EPP. Uh, but if they decide to vote together, if they decide to coordinate their action, they could be extremely powerful. And, and although we've seen the rise in the populist right in the 2014 elections and the 2019 elections, I think what we're going to see in these elections is they're going to cross a threshold where everyone's going to have to start doing business with them. They're going to be large enough to block sort of majorities forming on different um, key policy issues. They're going to be large enough to demand key committee chairs in the parliament. And they may even be large enough to demand that they have one of the major top jobs in Brussels. And I'd like to talk about uh, participation uh, for a moment. Uh, should, do you think, 
EU elections be seen as a reliable indicator of a national political mood? Or is there something about European elections that brings out far-right voters? Well, what we know from previous European elections is that mainstream parties tend to do badly in these elections. You're quite right that one aspect of these elections is that, is that voters use them to protest against national parties and national governments. Um, this, this partly sees a, a vote more for the populist right, but it also sees more votes for Greens, we know from the past. So although Greens are down in the polls, we think they're probably going to do slightly better in these elections than they do normally in national elections at the moment, because voters on the centre-left say, why vote for the mainstream centre-left when we can vote for the Greens and signal that we care about the environment? And on the other side, voters are saying, why vote for the mainstream right when we can vote for the radical right? And so we're going to see this polarisation, a continuation of this polarisation, particularly on environment questions. So you said that voters sometimes use their votes at the European Parliament as a protest vote. Do you think then, um, the other kind of flip side of that, that a lot of voters don't truly understand uh, what's at stake when they cast their ballots for their MEPs? Yeah, I think some voters don't really understand that. But for other voters, they say, well, I don't really see the consequences of my vote. The European Parliament, yes, it's powerful, but, you know, coalitions are forming issue by issue. There tends to be a grand coalition in the European Parliament. They don't see a clear choice in European elections and they don't see a connection between how they vote in these elections and what that means for Europe as a whole. So many voters think if that's the case, I might as well use my vote in these elections to influence national politics, to, to tell people um, I'm not happy with my national government or my national parties. So in a sense, it's not irrational for voters to use these elections to try to influence national politics rather than using these elections to influence European politics. I think it's fair to say that uh, every five years when these elections come around, uh, there's a lot of coverage, uh, a lot of uh, fears about a, a resurgent far right. Um, would you say that this year, 2024, feels materially different to previous years? Yeah, I think it does feel different. I mean, I, I think what's happening at the European level is what we've seen at the national level in several countries, where for a while we saw the rise of the populist right and, and mainstream parties could ignore it. Uh, and then at a certain point, they cross a threshold where now these parties are serious parties of government. So, for example, we're seeing this in the Netherlands. We could be seeing this in France. We could be seeing it in Germany. We've already seen it in Italy now with Meloni, the prime minister in Italy. And so in a certain sense, the rise, when do these parties stop rising and now actually are a mainstream party, a party that the, the voters and formation of government leads to these parties actually sitting around the cabinet table? And um, what we perhaps are seeing now at the European level is that happening, where for, for the last few elections, we've seen these getting larger. And these elections, it could be a breakthrough elections for these groups where they now start to be major parties at the European level, influencing Influencing policy and, and policy making in Brussels. Simon Hicks, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Simon Hicks, Professor of European and Comparative Politics at uh, the LSE London School of Economics. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us on France 24 today. Thank you. Bye.